Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Happy New Year to you all. It is 5.05 p.m. in the city of Lagos, Nigeria. My name is George from Ankali Lab, and I'll be your moderator for today. I am thrilled and I'm thrilled and excited to welcome you all to the first tiny ML talk in the continent of Africa, the city of Lagos, Nigeria, to be precise. Our speaker today is Daniel Sintunaik from Edge Impulse. He'll be working us through getting started with Tiny ML, train and deploy Tiny ML project with Edge Impulse. So before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsors. So we have um, our strategic partner, we have Deep Light, we have Edge Impulse, we have Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Reality AI, SimSense. For additional sponsorship, please reach out to betty at tinyml.org for more info. So just a quick reminder, next week, Tuesday, January the 19th, we'll have a talk presented by Lucas Bigger, a deep learning researcher from Plumerai. The title of the talk is Running Binarized Neural Network on Microcontroller, the same time next week, Tuesday. So if you're interested in presenting a talk, please do reach out to talks at tinyml.org. So this is our first TinyML talk in Nigeria, and the group is initiated by Ankali Lab. Currently, we have over 200 people, 200 members, and we'd like more individuals and companies to join. If you're interested, please reach out to David, George, or Sydney for more information. So we are excited to have Daniel, and Daniel will be putting us through how to use um, Edge Impulse to deploy tiny ML projects. So a quick background about Daniel. Daniel is a founding tiny ML engineer at Edge Impulse. He's also the co-author of the O'Reilly book, Tiny ML, which is regarded as the handbook for tiny ML, alongside with Pete Warden. He previously worked on the TensorFlow Lite team at Google. He co-founded Tiny Farm Inc., where he deployed machine learning on industrial scaled insects, which is quite interesting. So, um, Daniel, once again, welcome. I hand over to you. Thank you so much, George. And it's an absolute privilege to get to be here at the inaugural meetup for Nigeria's tiny ML community. Um, I really love the dev community in Lagos. So I was able to go and visit um, while I was working at Google um, and participate at some events. And it's just amazing to see like the the scale and the energy of the community. And I think you, you are gonna be on the map for technology for years to come. So it um, means a lot to me to get to, to speak here. Um, and I just wanna do a, a nice introduction um, to embedded ML. So we're gonna go through the sort of why and how, and then I'm gonna do a demo of how you can use some free online tools to get started playing with this stuff yourself. So. Um, as George mentioned, I'm the founding tiny ML engineer at Edge Impulse, and we build a set of tools which make it easy for any embedded engineer to start working with machine learning, even if you don't have any machine learning experience to start with. So we're going to talk about why ML is useful, what tiny ML is, and I'm going to do a live demo of our product to show off some of these concepts. So to get started, why, why is machine learning useful? So imagine a typical industrial sensor um, that was manufactured last year. So you've got maybe this, this lovely little um, manufactured package with a vibration sensor that can provide readings up to a thousand times a second. You've got a temperature sensor, which is, is similarly high frequency. Um, it's resistant to all sorts of environmental damage. It can send data for, for miles and miles of distance using a tiny amount of power. And it has an amazing processor that's capable of running more than 20 million instructions per second. So hardware we have these days is really, really good, right? Um, really, really capable. 
But what this sensor actually is capable of doing is sending some really basic things. So even though it's collecting all this data at high frequency, all it's doing is sending data once an hour with the average amount of motion, with the peak amount of motion and the current temperature. So even though we have all this high frequency sensor data in a super capable device, 99% of the data that is collected is discarded due to cost, bandwidth or power constraints. Um, we might not have the bandwidth to be able to transmit a thousand signals a second, a thousand samples a second, even though that's the rate at which the sensor is collecting data. And it might cost too much energy to transmit that data as well. So that means loads of interesting information gets lost from our signal. So for example, here, if we've got a, a signal from a three axis accelerometer, we might care about looking at what the peaks within that data are. That might give us some inf interesting information about what's going on with the signal. Um, and as you can see here, there's a peak here that doesn't look quite the same as the others. Um, it's a little bit flatter, it's a little bit wider. But if we are only sending some data, if we're only sending the highest value in a like one second or one hour window, we're going to miss out on all of these little minutia that may be really important to understand if there's something going wrong with the system that we're monitoring. So if we're only sending this peak on the left, we're missing out any information um, that's represented with these unusual looking peaks like the one on the right. Another, another thing to think about is that single numbers can be misleading. So here we've got two separate graphs which represent two very different motions happening um, in a connected accelerometer. So with the first one, the accelerometer um, is measuring a gesture where the device is being moved up and down like this. And in the second one, there's a circle. And visually, those look different. We can see that the um, particular axes that are uh, behaving in particular ways are different between the two. Um, but if we look at the RMS value for the um, accelerometer outputs, they're very, very similar for both. So this just shows how if you try and boil down this complex input into a single number to send via, for example, low power wireless, you miss out on a ton of information. Um, and the, the signals can look indistinguishable at that point, even though they're actually very, very different. So the only solution to this is having some intelligence on device. If we're able to have our device understand a bit of what's going on with the sensors and choose what to send, um, we, we can get much more inf interesting information sent across our um, wireless network. So maybe the device tells us that vibration looks like there's gonna be a fault. Maybe it's telling us the temperature's varying in a way that's unfamiliar and could be troublesome. Maybe it's telling us that the machine is working differently than other machines like it. And this is much more interesting information to have than just these basic values that previously um, our low power sensors are sending across the network. So the way we can use this is that if our sensor has some intelligence on device using ML, then it can send this interesting information out to the cloud and we can make use of it in our applications. So what ML and what embedded ML is all about is looking for patterns in data and being able to communicate those patterns rather than looking for the boring statistical basics of, of signals. So for example, maybe we're looking at a classification task where we want to understand what's happening right now with this machine that we're monitoring. Um, another thing we might want to be doing is anomaly detection, where we're trying to understand if the behavior of a machine or a system is out of the ordinary. And the third thing we might want to do is forecasting. So understanding what could happen, what does the data indicate might happen in the future with this system. And so to use, to do all of those things, we can use machine learning. And embedded machine learning basically is applying these existing machine learning tools that have been developed and debugged over decades of um, research and study 
and applying those to embedded systems. So traditionally machine learning is something we think of as happening in big servers, big beefy cloud machines that have GPUs and process huge amounts of data um, and require huge amounts of energy to sustain. But embedded machine learning, um, essentially the idea arose of why can't we do this type of work on tiny devices too? So one of the inspirations behind the idea of TinyML has been the need for devices to use low power to understand complex things in the world around them. And one of the most common things, um, common applications of that in the world, it may be sitting in your pocket right now, is the functionality within mobile phones to be able to understand wake words so they can wake up a, a digital assistant. So if I have an Android phone and I say the hot word, okay, Google, that is hopefully gonna result in the phone waking up and asking me if I, I need anything. And the way that happens is using a low power DSP chip, which is trained to, which is running a model that's trained to understand when those words are spoken. And that is a, a really good example of tiny ML because that's an example that's deployed on literally billions of devices worldwide already. So tiny ML is the topic of running ML on embedded devices. There's generally a focus on running inference, which is running the model rather than training a model. Um, because of the, the constraints of the devices, it makes more sense to think about inference rather than training. Um, and the idea is that we, we can understand an ML model as just a mathematical function with a bunch of parameters. There's no reason we can't run that math on an embedded device, especially as embedded devices who've got more and more capable over the years. So there are some trade-offs involved. So when you're trying to run models on tiny devices, you probably need to think about making the models a bit smaller and optimizing them in ways which better suit the hardware available on tiny devices as opposed to big powerful servers. So sometimes you have to think about trading off accuracy versus speed. Like what are the, the dials and the levers that I can change, which will allow me to take a model um, that was previously designed to run on a big server and tweak it and change it so that it will run on a small device and still give me adequate accuracy and be able to do the, the work that I wanted to do. And generally, TinyML um, is intended to target microcontrollers that are low power, have limited connectivity, limited bandwidth, um, need to have high reliability so they can't be dependent on the network connection for functionality, and they need to have low latency so that when something happens, they respond immediately. So if we talk about why running, why run ML on the edge? So generally, it's going to be much more efficient to do our computation on the device rather than send raw data over the network. Um, and this can be counterintuitive. You might think, hey, if we're running a lot of, a lot of work, a high workload on our embedded processor, isn't that going to use lots of power? Well, it might use, might use some power, but generally the most power expensive thing that you can do with an embedded device is communicate over a network. Whether you're doing, if you're doing this wirelessly, transmitting requires a lot of energy. And so often it's much better if you can do some processing on the device and then send a small amount of data with the result of that processing over the network rather than try to send all of the raw data over the network. And often it's just not even possible to send the raw data over the network due to bandwidth constraints. So if you think about situations where you've got high frequency, messy data, so for example, an accelerometer, which is producing a lot of um, information at a high frequency, if we can do some signal processing and understand what this data means on the device, we can get away with sending a message whenever every, anything interesting happens rather than sending data all the time. So here's some ideas of the types of 
tasks that we can do and the types of sensors we can work with. And the answer, it really is pretty much any, any type of sensor. So everything from recognizing sounds, so understanding what a person is saying or what some kind of other system is doing um, that, that makes an audible sound. We can classify images. So any kind of image that's captured by an image sensor, we can process that on device and try and understand what the image means. We can do things like biosignal analysis, where imagine you've got some um, sensors hooked up to your body and you're able to understand what they mean. So that could be that we're looking at someone's heart rate. It could be we're looking at brain waves, um, any type of data that we can collect from a, a human or animal body or from plants. And then things like detecting abnormal vibration or mechanical stress in an industrial machine, for example. Um, so pretty much any type of sensor from microphone through to radar or um, electrodes that measure the um, electric fields in a human body, any of that stuff can be fed into a machine learning model and used to understand what's going on. So the way this works architecturally is you start off with a model running on a device. So this is an example of a, a, a nice development board for embedded machine learning. It's the Arduino Nano 33BLE Sense. And it's a ARM Cortex M4 based microcontroller. So it's um, got, you know, a few hundred kilobytes of RAM. I think it runs at like um, 96 megahertz and it is able to um, store enough of a, a large enough model to be able to do a bunch of useful stuff. Um, so the um, stuff that happens on the device is the um, inference and signal processing but there's some other stuff that happens beforehand so on the the first thing we need to do when we are developing an embedded ml solution is we need to train a model so that's not something that we do on the device that's typically something we'll do on a powerful development machine or in the cloud after we've collected some sample data um, once we have a model we can take that model and deploy it onto the device. And the device is able to then take raw sensor data, transform it with some signal processing, run the signal from that through the model and understand what happens as a result of, of um, the model's output. And then we're able to send the conclusions that we've made to the cloud. So, Edge Impulse, which I'm going to give you a quick demo of, is a free tool for developers and it helps with all the different parts of that process. So it starts out by helping you collect a data set from your embedded device and basically digesting that data and understanding if it's feasible to train a model from it. It then helps you train a machine learning model and it also helps you pick a good signal processing pipeline because signal processing is key to making this stuff work. You don't often pass in raw sensor data to a model, although you can, um, but quite often you will send the data through a typical signal processing algorithm. For example, you might turn audio data into a spectrogram before running it through the model. And Edge Impulse will help you pick the right signal processing pipeline. It then helps you pick an architecture and train a model which works well on device. It will help you test that. And then it finally helps you deploy the model to your device. Um, and so this whole, whole sort of workflow, it's an iterative workflow. You wanna collect a bit of data, uh, train a model, upload it to the device, see how it performs, collect some more data, make some changes. Um, and there's a nice kind of feedback loop there that you can participate in as a developer. And all of that stuff, um, which I refer to as the ML workflow, um, is stuff that you can do in Edge Impulse without necessarily needing any ML experience. So some really, really good ways to get started with embedded ML. Um, so first of all, I'm going to show you Edge Impulse today, and um, we have a ton of really good documentation, and you can hopefully go and check that out and um, start experimenting um, using some of the stuff I'm going to show you. 
the other thing I recommend, obviously, is the book that Pete and I wrote on Tiny ML. So this goes a little bit like of a deep dive into breaking down what is embedded ML, um, what are some of the things you can do with it, and it goes through a line by line, line by line dissection of some code examples of. Um, how to use embedded ML at a very low level. So you don't necessarily need to know all of that stuff to be able to work with embedded ML, but it is helpful in having an understanding of like what's going on at a low level when I'm using these tools. So um, either of those things are fun. If you go to tinymlbook.com, we have a few chapters available as a free preview that you can download. And um, we're also, there's a bunch of cool resources online. So we're working on an online course for Edge Impulse, which is going to come out very soon. So um, I'm, I'm super excited about that. And there's also a, a tiny ML course from Harvard that is available online for free on Harvard's ed, edX platform. And um, so there's, there's online courses that are available too, if you're that type of learner. So the, the quickest way to get started with Edge Impulse and don't do this now because I'm gonna gonna show you some of this thing anyway. But when you want to get started, you can go to edgeimpulse.com. You don't even have to create an account. You can just scroll down to the QR code on the page, scan it with your phone, and start training a model immediately based on data you collect from your phone. So you don't even need a microcontroller dev kit. You don't even need to create an Edge Impulse account. You can just get started in like one minute using your mobile phone, which is cool. And you can collect accelerometer data, audio or photos. So now I'm gonna show you a demo of what Edge Impulse looks like and how it works. So um, I will switch over to my browser and hopefully you can still see this. So the thing I wanna show you to begin with is our, um, interface. So if you look at uh, what's on the screen right now, this is called Edge Impulse Studio. And it's basically a web application that guides you through the process of training a model and evaluating it and then deploying it to device. So this is a project we've created already. Um, and what it does, it's similar to what I was talking about in the slides, which is that it's recognizing gestures based on accelerometer data. So we collected a bunch of data from um, sensors that are on dev kits like this. This is that Arduino Nano board. And I basically collected a bunch of data for four different labels. So I've got idle data where the board is just sitting there doing nothing. It's not moving at all. I've got a snake gesture I can do where I go like this, like a little snake. I've got an up down gesture where I'm just lifting the board gently up and down like that. And I have a wave gesture where I'm doing like this. And so these are four different gestures that I want to recognize when they're happening on device. And you can imagine this being in some kind of consumer product where maybe like a toy where you wave it around and it does things. But the same concept applies to really serious things. So imagine you're monitoring a vehicle to determine whether it's got a fault or not. So maybe when the vehicle has a fault, um, it starts vibrating a ton or it starts um, bucking in a certain way and you can determine that something is wrong. So you could collect data for the, those states as well. And what I've done here basically is collect a couple of minutes worth of data for each type of thing I want to be able to detect. And these are my classes, right? So they're classes of thing that I want to be able to detect. And it's really easy to, to collect more data. So with Edge Impulse, I'm just connected to my dev kit here. There's a bunch of them with support. Um, you can see my device here. I'm gonna collect a bit more data. So let's collect some more up, down data. I wanna connect collect five seconds of data there from the accelerometer. So all I do is click this button. It'll give me a little countdown. And then I'll start doing my gesture. So I'm doing an up down gesture now. That's now been uploaded from the device. You can see it appear in edge impulse here. And I can even see a graph of what it looks like. So 
super easy to collect new data and then you can use that data to train your model so that's how we collected all of this you can also upload data in whatever format you have or if you have it in a cloud system you can just um, sideload it across to edge impulse so we have a ton of easy ways for you to get data into the system um, so once you've got some data you've got to figure out what what are we going to do with it so the create impulse page here guides you through the process of setting up a chain of signal processing and machine learning. And so what I've done here, I've got a block here initially, which will choose how do we cut up our input data to feed into our chain here. So pardon me, what that means is that when you've got a sensor collecting data, you generally want to take a window of that data because it's a, a time series of data we want to take a window of that data and decide hey um, i'm going to pass this window of data through this signal processing and ml chain and try and understand what happened within that window so i've got this set up and configured with a two second window size so we're going to take two seconds worth of accelerometer data we then pass it into a signal processing block so here we've got a spectral analysis block, which does a bunch of different things to transform the data to create some high level features to feed into our neural network. And this allows us to use a, a fast and well understood set of um, signal processing algorithms to create an input for our neural network that allows the neural network to more easily understand what's going on than if you passed in raw data. Neural networks can learn to do pretty much anything, right? But they're not necessarily the most efficient way of doing things. So if you can do some signal processing before you feed things into your neural network, you make the neural network's job easier. And that means you have to do less processing on device. And you can often make use of hardware supported signal processing <laughs> tools or um, uh, if you have like an onboard DSP, for example. So we have a bunch of these different signal processing blocks available. Um, you can see a few of them here. So we have signal processing blocks for dealing with everything from audio data through to image data. Um, different types of time series data. And you can even create your own custom signal processing blocks if there's something really cool that you know how to do. And you can hook those into Edge Impulse very easily using a Docker container. So we then have our neural network block. So this means we're going to train a neural network to try and understand this data. And we also have an anomaly detection block. So this is a different type of machine learning model. It's not a neural network. It's a k-means clustering algorithm. And what it does is tries to learn what is typical of the data in our data set so that it can understand when data comes in, this is atypical, which might represent an anomaly. So I'll talk about that more in a moment. But first, let's go look at the spectral analysis block. So my block here is doing a few things. So first of all, this is our raw data. And you see this white box represents a window of the data. That's our two second window. So within our two second window, we're first filtering the data. Um, ah, and I have a problem with um, my Safari browser. It keeps not displaying images for some reason. So there's a couple of things missing from this page. So I'm gonna try and refresh. Um, doesn't look like that's working. So I'm gonna open it in Chrome instead. So let me share my whole screen with you. Okay, so now I've opened this in Google Chrome because Safari never works for anything. Um, you can see the frequency domain and spectral power um, of these of this sample. We've broken those down and we've plotted those as well. And those features are then going to be available for our neural network. Um, you can see all of this is configurable. We choose some sensible default values for you, um, but we um, allow you to configure all of this stuff and 
So you can find a bunch of um, settings that work well for your model. But the output of this is really interesting. So if we look at, we've, we generate these features for all of our data set, we can then plot some of these values on a visualization. And that helps us understand if our data can actually be um, separated by our model. So if you look what we've done here, we've got the um, root mean square value for each of the axes for our window. And we have that plotted on this 3D visualization here. And you can see that if we plot by the RMS values, we're able to separate our groups of our, our classes into different groups. So they're clearly visually separable here. So all of the up downs are clustered together here. We've got the snake gestures are all clustered like this. And the waves are in two different groups or three different groups, but they're all very separate from other stuff. And the way that neural networks work is they learn to be able to separate things. They learn the boundaries between different groupings of stuff. And they can do so in a very highly dimensional space. So we have a bunch of different features here. And even with just our RMS value, we're able to see that visually we could quite clearly easily separate these values. And so because we can do that visually, it's a good clue that a deep learning model is going to be able to do the same thing, to learn to do the same thing. So that's a good sign. It looks like um, things are, are looking good for our data with this signal processing pathway. So we can go look at the neural network block. So a neural network is composed of layers. And we have a nice visual editor here that lets you design a neural network. So we will pick one for you to use as a default based on our understanding of the type of data you're using. Um, but you can also customize this to your heart's content. So it's a nice, easy way of playing with um, machine learning model architectures. You can also play with some of these other hyperparameters here and um, train a model. It usually only takes a few minutes to train a model for tiny models because they're very small. And we'll give you an assessment of the way the model's performing. And what's really nice is we can understand, okay, this is how the model's doing. This is how it's performing at trying to categorize all of these different classes. Um, but we can also see how the model is performing on device. So we give you an estimate of how long it will take to run inference um, on device, how much memory your um, model's gonna use on the device in terms of both RAM and ROM. So you can easily understand, does this fit within the budget I have for my program? So that's super powerful. Um, and then we also have an anomaly detection model here that you can train. I talked about a little earlier. So here you can see how it's understood our training data falls within these clusters. So it's, it's learned the bounds of the clusters that our training data exists within. And if new data comes in, that falls outside of these clusters, then it will recognize that the data isn't typical of the data that's in our training set. So that allows us to understand that this data might represent an anomaly. Maybe this value is something that um, we haven't encountered during training. And so it might be worth alerting a user of or doing something based on um, in our application space. So what I wanna do um, finally with this model is just to give you an example of this. So I'm gonna collect five seconds of data doing a gesture and we'll see how our model can um, actually understand what's going on. So if I click sampling, sample and start doing a uh, gesture. So I'm doing our up down gesture for five seconds. So Edge Impulse is now classifying this data with the model I created. Oh, and you can see that my model's actually pretty confused. I must have been doing this a bit wrong because I, my model picked up that I was doing the snake gesture. And I think what's happened there is the data I capture was um, from a different board that has the accelerometer in a different orientation. And so it's picked out the a different gesture here than the one I thought I was doing. And that's because I'm using a different board than the one I collected my training data with. So that is a good example of um, 
something to think about when you're collecting data, which is that the data that you have, it's representative of a particular device, but often you need to collect a big data set with lots of data from lots of different devices so that your model is able to pick out the correct thing and understand what's going on um, regardless of the particular device that you're using. Um, but you can see here that our, um, my, my um, activity was classified as snake um, and you can see where it appears on the um, plot. But um, what I can also show you if I do this again, I'm gonna do some crazy stuff. I'm gonna shake it around like crazy. Um, so hopefully this is gonna be picked up as an anomaly because the training data set doesn't contain anything that looks quite like that. So you can see I have high scores for anomaly for a lot of these. Um, so it, it did correctly classify um, a couple of these as anomaly. It also misclassified some as snake and up down, but I can change the threshold for my anomaly detection. So I can see here there's some decently high values for some of it. And um, I might want to just adjust my anomaly detection threshold a little bit here um, so that it picks up the right thing. So you can see how this workflow works. You train a model based on some initial data. You can then test it out within Edge Impulse. I discovered here that, hey, the data that I have was collected from a different device. So um, the model's not performing well. So I can just add that data that I've now collected to my training data set, retrain the model, and hopefully get better results next time. And then when it comes to deployment, it's super easy. So um, you can choose to either export your model as a, a code library. So that could be just a plain C++ library. It could be an Arduino library, or it could be a library that makes use of a vendor specific technology. So if you have a STM bo an ST board, um, we can, deploy a model as a C++ library using STM32 Cube AI, which is ST's AI um, acceleration framework. We can also deploy as WebAssembly, which is very portable and can be run on anything from a Raspberry Pi through to a website or a mobile phone. And we can even deploy firmwares that are um, for specific boards, which you can then deploy directly to the board and run your model on that board um, with a single command. So that's super awesome for testing your model directly on a device without even having to write any application code. So I showed you this um, one sensor type, but we support a bunch of others. So I'm gonna switch back to my Safari and um, I can show you a few. So here we've got audio. So this model is trained to understand what a person is saying. Um, once again, this is not working in Safari, so let's open it in Chrome. So here you can see this is an audio sample. So this is just um, somebody saying a certain word. And we're using an MFCC signal processing block. And that's able to turn this raw audio into a spectrogram, which is a 2D visualization, a 2D representation of that audio. So um, on the y-axis, we have frequency buckets, and on the x-axis is time. So we've turned this raw audio into a 2D representation of the audio in the frequency domain, and we then feed that into a slightly different neural network. So this is fed into a convolutional neural network, which is really good for understanding stuff um, that's two-dimensional like that. And one of the cool things we're able to do is add data augmentation, which allows us to randomly transform the data during training to improve the robustness of the model. So we've got that enabled and we're able to train a model that gets 94% accuracy in discerning between a couple of different keywords. So that again, uses a really small amount of memory and we can see all of that in this studio here. So other sensor types that we can use include sight. So I'll show you here a model that we've trained with vision sensors. Um, so we've got a data set that's just made up of images of stuff. So here's a Christmas tree. Um, this is just an, an unknown 
thing. Um, we've got a different plant that's one of our classes. Um, we've got a lamp, which is our, our third class, which is a, a, a random household item we want to recognize. And we're able to train a model which uh, is based on a low resolution version of the image. We pass in this low resolution version of the image to a transfer learning block. And this uses a pre-trained model, which already understands how to interpret visual information. And it applies it to our particular task of determining if something is a lamp, a plant, or an unknown other type of item. And you can see this model is much bigger. It's about 500K in size. It uses 300K of RAM, but it gets really good performance on discerning between these three things. So it's super easy to add any other type of data. You just upload it to Edge Impulse. We automatically understand whether it's a time series or whether it's an image or whether it's some other type of thing. And we'll suggest the um, best default settings to use to start building your model. Um, the other thing that's really cool that's coming very soon is an AutoML pipeline, which does all of the work for you of figuring out what the best parameters are. So it will determine what is the best input size, um, what are the best signal processing algorithms to use, and what is the best neural network architecture and hyperparameters, and automatically present you with the best possible model given your budget for latency and memory. So we're really excited about that and that's coming very soon and it will make things even easier. So that's it from my, my demo there. And I wanted to um, just say a last couple of words. So ML is, is super exciting. You know, there's a huge amount of stuff that you can do with ML on embedded devices. It really works. And the best way to get a sense for how to in, in, incorporate it into your products and the types of things it's good for is to play with it yourself. So I definitely recommend heading over to edgeimpulse.com and um, trying out our little um, quick start demo using the QR code. It's super cool to try. And if you, you can add embedded ML to your toolkit, you're going to be able to start making use of the remaining 99% of sensor data that currently gets thrown away um, when people are working with embedded IoT sensors. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope this was interesting. And I think George has some more cool stuff to show you. And I'd be happy to answer some questions as well. All right, thank you, Daniel, for the awesome talk. So while we're on that, I'm, I'm still trying to switch to my other camera for, okay, I think we are good. So, um, actually I have like two demos to go through. I think Daniel already did like a basic intro on how to use an Arduino BNE for, um, for gesture recognition. So we have three um, classes. We have the upright, we have the rolling, then we have falling. So, and um, I'm supposed to, I've actually trained the model. So what I just have to do is to use the serial communication to display the results. So the whole idea is that you gather data using edge imports. I actually did this like yesterday evening and I'm kind of excited to show you guys how it works. And the second demo is, let me just talk about the second demo. So the second demo basically is um, basic image um, classification using open MV camera. So the whole idea is to I want to classify um, two different boards. I have um, Tinsney 3.5, 3.6, and I have ESPI camera here. So I'm trying to classify, actually I have three classes. I have Tinsney, I have no board. When there is nothing there, then I have ESP high camera. So I think I will probably start with the um, open MV camera. Then eventually, if we have time, I'll probably switch to the um, gesture recognition. So with that, let's start with um, let's start with I'll share my screen.
So I already have the model on the device. Then all I just have to do is um, I just have to like plug to power the camera. I just have to plug it. Um, plug just to power the camera, plug the USB to power the camera. So the whole idea is that I was supposed to use like an external power to power the camera, but as I can as well as use my um, laptop. So now you have, um, I don't know whether you guys can see the images. Okay. Can you see? Okay. So now if there is nothing there, you see no board. Is it visible? Okay, this is no board. Can can you see the text? So we have um, if you can see the window by the you can see the window by the right. So you can see there is no board there, right? Then after that, we have the Tinsney board. Then we have um, we have the sorry for the convenience. Then we have the um, we have the ESPI. So we have the Tinsney. Then you have the ESPI. Then if you don't have any board, you have no board. So this is just basic image classification using edge and pause on open MV camera. Then the last demo, I don't think we'll have enough time for that, but um, if there's still time, okay, we still have like five minutes more. So let me see what I can do that. So this is just basic image classification using um, Edge Import um, platform for that. So the next demo is um, gesture recognition. Let me just set my camera so I can have more time to connect to the terminal. So, So this is it here. Can you all see my screen? Can you all see my screen? What can you see? Um, we can see the OpenMV window. You can see the OpenMV window. I have to like, um, stop sharing my screen. OK. So. Um, So can you see the um, Arduino BLE? You know what, let's just leave this Arduino BLE demo. So for now, that's just a little demo that I have for today's talk. So the whole idea is just to motivate people to look into OpenMV, um, look into Edge Imports platform to kickstart their tiny ML um, career or tiny ML project for the meantime. So once again, um, uh, Daniel, thank you for the awesome talk. I really appreciate for the time um, taking to um, share your knowledge. It's very important to us, especially down here in Africa. And thanks for the all support. And also I have a question. Um, my question is, do you guys support um, the ESP32 device? Hello, can you hear me? Um, yeah, yeah. So we we do, and we actually have community members. We basically the um, thing that you can download from Edge Impulse is just a C plus plus eleven library. It doesn't make any assumptions about um, what type of hardware you're using. It will automatically try and use features if available in your compiler um, that speed up inference on certain hardware. But as long as you can build a C plus plus eleven library and um, link that into your application, then you, you're good to go. So we have a, a bunch of people who have used um, all sorts of ESP devices. Okay, so, so another question I have is, um, okay, this is an anonymous um, question. Is it possible to export to Onyx? That's another question. Yeah, good question. Um, so the route to doing that would be just to... Um, basically put together uh, 
your model and then um, you would uh, download a TensorFlow file that um, we allow you to export all of the intermediate kind of parts of the impulse that you've built. So you can download a TensorFlow model and then you can use uh, any of the tools available to convert that into an Onyx format. So we have another question. Can you deploy the model to a jetting device? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a bunch of ways you can do that. You could either run, you could either download the TensorFlow model, run it on there. You could run our C++ code directly on the device, although that won't use the GPU acceleration. Um, so the best way, the best way to do that would be to download the TensorFlow model um, from Edge Impulse, which is all available on the dashboard within the product. Then um, we have another question. Can Edge Impulse target other languages such as Adele, Rust, etc.? I think you already support and Python. Do you support what, what language do you support? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, we, we output a C11 library. So if you're able to um, kind of write a wrapper around that or call that from, from your language of choice, then that will work. But um, we don't have libraries in any other languages. We have like a lot of questions. So let me take two more questions. So what is different when you change the frequency? Does all devices support it, support the same frequency or is it different between devices? Um, good question. So it, it basically, it's we don't have any particular um, strong opinion about frequencies and, and that type of thing of sensor data. You can input any time series into Edge Impulse. So your time series, it might be like, you know, 10 megahertz. It might be one sample per week. And we, we just don't care. Um, we just take time series and we let you train models on those. Okay, one more question. Um, model deployed through, this is a question. Models deployed through Arduino library. Does the Arduino library need to be to have AI slash ML offline offloading chip, or will, you, will it be possible to run it on all Arduino devices? Um, it's it's only really possible to run on 32-bit Arduino devices. So um, you're not going to be able to run this on the um, the 8-bit Arduinos, but the 32-bit devices um, like the one I have here, or like the um, Maker Zero. I think um, boards will will be able to run our library. Okay, and I have one um, question to you. So, how does it feel like after um, having like successful ten thousand projects on Edge Impulse? What does it feel like? Oh, it feels really good. I mean, I I started with the company. The company has only been around for about a year and a half. So, um, the founders started it during the the summer of um, last year, oh, sorry, two, two years ago, 2019. Um, and then I joined around this time of um, 2020. And it's just been so exciting. You know, we hadn't even launched when I joined. We, we launched at a, a conference and got loads of, of people really excited to begin with. But then we just watched the, the number of projects grow and it sort of starts out slow and then starts going up like this and it's just very exciting to see that growth because the thing that's come with it is that our community has been growing and growing and we have a, a forum with super engaged people who are helping each other out we have loads of people posting cool projects they've built on twitter um we we're really engaged with our community we have a bunch of people who are ambassadors within the community who are people who have just built such awesome stuff that we've reached out to them and asked them if they want to be part of our team and we sent them a bunch of hardware and and cool stuff and they're using that to do their own talks and demos so it's it's been so exciting to see all this energy forming and i think it's exciting most exciting for me that we're allowing embedded engineers to become ML engineers. So if you're an embedded engineer and you want to add ML to your toolkit, you can just, you know, get something up and running within a few minutes. And 
the types of things people are doing are just amazing. The things that we would never have thought of on the Edge Impulse team, but people with this amazing domain knowledge that all of you embedded engineers have um, are able to, to come up with some really cool stuff. So it's been very exciting. Thank you very much for the talk. And, um, we do hope to see you next time on um, Tiny ML on Nigeria. So I would like to thank our sponsors. I want to thank our Tiny ML sponsors, um, Deep Light, Edge Impulse for the speaker, Maxim Integrated, Pixel, Reality AI, and Simpson. So I'm um, our strategic partner, build software and hardware foundation for tiny ml deep light we use ai to make other ai faster smaller and more efficient and more power efficient please check out the link below if you have if you're interested edge impulse tiny ml platform for all developers please kindly check the link below for more information Maxim Integrated, enabling edge intelligence. The new Max 7800 implements AI inference at over, 10, at over 100 times lower energy than other embedded option. Now AI can, edge can see and hear like never before. Then we have Kixo Auto ML for embedded AI automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solution for the edge using sensor data. Kindly check the link below for more information. We have Reality AI. Reality AI is, is for building products. Kindly check the links below for more information. Then finally, we have SyncSense. SyncSense, um, builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge device and edge devices. We design systems for real time, always on smart sensing for audio vision, IMUs, biosignal, and more. For more information, kindly check the link below. So once again, we want to remind you for of our next tiny ML talk holding next Tuesday, January 19th. Our presenter is Lucas Giga from Plumerai, a deep learning researcher. The talk is titled Running Binarized Neural Network on Microcontrollers. The talk will be held at the same time, just like today, 5 p.m. West African time, 8 a.m. Pacific time. For more information, please, um, if you are interested in presenting a talk, kindly reach out to talks at tinyml.org. Once again, Daniel, thank you for the talk. Hope to see you again. Thank you so much, George, and all the other organizers um, for this awesome meetup group.